he, you know, he says they did the work of, you know, three months in one night. This is incredible. The British simply can't believe it. But, you know, again, and also the Admiral team, the Admiral, uh, you know, in the Harbor says to how we have to go. You have to get, you have to get rid of these cannons. So we're gone. We, cause you know, he was at the far end of the range of Knox's cannons and it really would be a lucky shot to get him, but they still couldn't afford to have that, you know, possibility. So General Howe, again, he's in shock, but he tries to get together an invasion force to attack Dorchester Heights and Washington anticipates this and, he, and they're just ready to blow him all the heck. And, and then the strangest thing in the world happens, this incredible freak storm hits. And so Howe's invasion force can't, can't go. And actually it, it saved his, his force from being decimated. And he realizes the game's up that, you know, the Americans had the upper hand at this moment because they, they can't even reach them with their cannons. They can't even reach those heights, but yet they can just lob all these, these shells into Boston. And so he sent a, you know, a note to George Washington saying, if you leave me alone, we're going to abandon the city. And so the British have to evacuate. And this gives, you know, I mean, it's amazing when you think about it, because Washington and Knox watch from way up on Dorchester Heights as these British, basically, you know, all these ships and as many loyalists as they could pack into them, leave Boston. So they forced this most powerful army on earth to leave. And it's the first victory of the American Revolution. And again, this gives them... Uh, time and it gives them, uh, you know, a shot in the arm and also lets, wakes up the French who say, wait a minute, you know, maybe if we support the Americans, you know, we can stick it to the British and, and they'll lose their foothold in the new world. So this opens up all sorts of possibilities. But again, the feat of taking, of not only getting the cannons back to Boston was incredible, but then taking them and you know, sneaking them up to the top of Dorchester Heights in the dead of night and finishing up just by dawn and then bombing, you know, Boston was just an incredible feint, an incredible surprise attack. And it had all the ear, earmarks of, you know, brilliant, a brilliant generalship because this is what, you know, Washington, when he crosses Delaware later, would, would become known for the fact that he could pull off these Hail Marys when, when everybody thought he was beat and everybody thought they're done. And then he would do something that would just go against all protocol, especially in the mind of the British. And, and he would prevail. So this is, this is one of those first moments. And again, this is, you know, Washington was doubted by all sorts of people, you know, who thought, you know, this guy can't, he's not going to do this. Um, you know, he's not doing anything. He's just sitting there. And so this was really his Hail Mary, you know, too, personally, you know, as well for the revolution. Hey, everyone, Scott here. One more brief word from our sponsors. I'm curious uh, your take on the significance of the noble train. I mean, you mentioned that it was a critical victory for the American Revolution. The victories before this were really symbolic if we look at Lexington and Concord or Bunker Hill that don't involve that many people at all. They're very well known, but their overall significance is minor. Why could you describe more of the significance of the noble train? Is it because it made the rest of the war possible? Do you think the Revolutionary War would have been snuffed out right now had they not brought the cannons? Well, you know, and also the noble train comes from the name from a letter that Henry Knox wrote to George Washington from the wilderness. He just crossed back from uh, Lake George and gone through the heck, you know, and trying to get these cannons back. And he writes to me, he says, he's very optimistic. You know, he says, I just got back. We're going to get the sleds, the, the 49 sleds, the Knoxon. We're going to get all these, and we're going to bring your excellency his noble train of artillery. So he's elevated it right there to something noble, something beyond the cause, the, the terrestrial cause of winning the war. This is this is a noble quest. Okay, so how does that fit into the whole you know, panorama of the, the Revolutionary War? Well, this is the first victory 
And you can say, well, the British were probably going to leave Boston anyway and go to New York. So, you know, was this a great victory? It was. You couldn't let the British sit there and leave on their own timetable. First of all, they may may not have left because they could have always just come and attacked Washington outside. Because as you said, you know, they had these small battles before, nothing great. This is the first time that Washington was facing the full might of the British force. And everybody just thought the British was going to crush the Americans. This is going to be nothing. So, so what Henry Knox did was in bringing these cannons and forcing the British out was it, it showed that they could stick a finger into the eye of the British forces and the, the, this British juggernaut of, you know, these, this incredible army and Navy and force them out of, of Boston and force them, you know, to to leave, and and of course they went and reoccupied, and and it and it knocked the momentum back that the British had that we were just going to come in and crush you. So, if this hadn't happened, well, the British could have sat there; they were reinforcing anyway. Maybe they would have gone to New York, and of course, New York's a disaster for Washington anyway. But they either way, you know, they could have come back and pushed on and decided, you know, we're going to take out the the Americans here outside of Boston. Um, either way, they would have had the upper hand. They would have been calling the shots. And, you know, war is momentum. And especially when you want to bring somebody else in on your side. And so this let the French and others know, hey, you know, this isn't a foregone conclusion. That the Americans just forced the British out and they got their first victory. And it also bought them time. You know, so Washington could you know, kind of consolidate his army and start to try and or put his army together. So if this had happened, the army was in, if you read Washington's place, the army was in real, real danger of just falling apart right there outside of Boston, just from disease, from desertion, from no money, from no gunpowder. You know, this is a war of, because it's always like, well, why did people stay in this war? Because it gets even worse as the war goes on. And really, it's a war of an ideal, which which is amazing in a way because there's no war had been fought like this before, and it's a war of momentum. You know that, you know, uh, crossing valley, uh, crossing the Delaware. You know, at the the lowest point, and they and they they beat the Hessians. You know, in Trenton and Princeton, and you know this gives the Americans just another great shot in the arm. So, in that way. You know, the noble train kept the revolution alive so they could go fight another day. As far as you're aware, has the noble train impacted or been looked at as a case study for military affairs of how to run a covert resupply mission or how to quickly erect a fortification to surprise an enemy? Yeah, actually, a guy named Thomas Campo, I think was his name, in early 2000s for his thesis at the military college, uh, and he was an officer in the Army, he wrote a whole study on it. And basically what he said, it it was for the fact of creating this sort of covert operation, which it was, um, this incredible logistical uh, operation, how they did it, and then how they capitalized on surprising the British and getting the upper hand. And he went through it very methodically and, you know, in, in how it relates to operations today, covert operations today, and how it had the elements of surprise. It, it had, you know, the, the elements of doing something that the, the enemy didn't think was possible. And then, of course, of course it had the element of incredible logistical uh, operations, you know, moving you know, the, the cannon and getting them in place and really twice moving it from, you know, for Ticonderoga and then get him up in the Dorchester Heights. So, you know, and he's very, uh, he studied the way the, you know, the, the cannons were moved and how they were broken into these five groups, these five packets that were sort of like a caterpillar as they moved. They, they would spread out, you know, for miles and then they'd come back together, you know, and then they'd spread out again. So again, you know, it was, it was sort of an operation, a very early operation in the American Army that succeeded. So it was worth studying, you know, in the year 2000 um, because 
you know, it, it had all the things you want in a covert operation, you know, surprise, audacity, um, and, and getting the upper hand, the checkmate, if you will, on your enemy. And that's really what Washington did. He checkmated General Howe it, because Howe had the assumption that there's no way the Americans could threaten them. They just, they didn't regard him as anything. Well, he did the one thing. He took the one Achilles heel that they were vulnerable. And that is that the fact that the British did not occupy Dorchester Heights. Why? Because Howe said, you know what? The rebels take it. We'll take it back. Who cares? Again, he didn't regard them at all. Well, and then Washington puts the artillery up there. It's the one thing, it was the one weakness he exploited of the British. And it, but it was enough. And because once the cans were up there, he how could do nothing. He couldn't attack them. You know, he he couldn't he couldn't even shoot cannonballs back at them because they couldn't reach him. And he couldn't protect the British ships in the harbor. So there went his supply line. So he had to go. You know, and he did. Something we've touched on is that this story, it's not known as well as Lexington, Concord, Bunker Hill, Yorktown. What do you think is the most important reason that this story should be remembered and placed alongside those other Revolutionary War events that we do know more about? Yeah, you bring up a great point, because I heard of this story in passing many times when reading like 1776, David McCullough's book, and others. And... It intrigued me. It always intrigued me. But then when I went to find out more, there was nothing really written on it. Nothing was called out. Um, and uh, so it was always mentioned, you know, in it's part of something larger. Um, and so it never got the attention of, say, a Bunker Hill or, uh, you know, Concord, Lexington or, you know, crossing the Delaware. These are iconic battles that, that came in. Well, this was an incredible logistical feat that, in fact, was the reason we beat, we got our first victory. So in that way, it's been overlooked. And again, you know, a few people I've talked to so far about the book, they're like, I never heard that story. And because there's only some kid books written on it. Now, there was a one gentleman who wrote a very small book. And, of course, Henry Knox kept a diary. And so, you know, primary source material is very hard to come by. There's the letters of Henry Knox. There's this diary. And then there's the few people who, you know, tried to piece it together. Well, this guy, you know, published this very thin little book, I think, uh, you know, 60s. And he did a lot of painstaking work. And it's only, it's not even a real book. It's like this pamphlet almost, where he put together what Henry Knox did. And, you know, there's markers uh, on highways today showing Henry Knox's route. But, again, it was sort of a peripheral, this happened, but, you know, we're not really sure how it happened. And, and, and it was part of another thing. And so, you know, calling it out and saying this is just as important as, you know, Lexington and Concord, if not more, is it, it, very, you know, apropos because it has not gotten its just desserts because again it it was in this embedded incredible thing that happened yet you know nobody had ever put all the pieces together right when i first heard about this i was really intrigued by the story so i'm glad you could come on and flesh it out a lot more and in your book there's a lot more to unpack of course and the book is called henry knox's noble train the story of a boston bookseller's heroic expedition that saved the american revolution william thanks for joining us Thank you very much for having me. All right, listeners. Well, that is all that I have for today's episode. Once again, I want to start things off by thanking the Spy Masters of History Unplugged. I'll explain what that is in a second. Our Spy Masters include Bill Ivey, Moondoggy from Ohio, Tom from Ohio, Ryan Gillen, Rob from Chicago, Nick Brooks, Michael from New York, Carl from Norway, Josh Reddick, Jennifer French Lee, Jake Carrington, the McCrays, David Santi, Chris C., and Baron Fraser. If you'd like to support the show, there's some very easy ways to do so. First, go to the site halfpricehistory.com. I've worked out an arrangement with a lot of the authors who've appeared on this show, and you can go there and get their books for 50% off. All you have to do is go to halfpricehistory.com and enter the promo code UNPLUGGED at checkout, 
Second, please leave a review and subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast player of choice, whether Apple Podcasts or Spotify or Stitcher or whatever. Third, join our Facebook group. You can go to Facebook and search for 